Thank you, Arlene. All right, if you have your Bibles, why don't you uh, join me in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through, through 5. As uh, we can join with Peter and say thank you to God for all that he has, has done for us and the real meaning, the significance of what it means to know Christ and to enjoy the salvation that we've been given, how life-changing it is and how eternity-changing it is. When Billy Graham was in London in the early uh, 1950s, during one of his uh, crusade meetings, a couple of guys came in, a couple of British guys came in to make fun of the Americans. They hated Americans, and they wanted to disrupt the meeting. And so uh, they kind of, two, two rebels kind of find each other, so they ended up uh, connecting, and then as they came into the auditorium and sitting together, but as they sat there, their hearts were changed, and as the invitation came, the one stood up and said, I'm going forward. I'm going to invite Christ into my life tonight. And the second one said, yeah, I'm going with you, and here's your wallet. I picked your pocket on the way in here. It makes a lot of difference coming to Christ. And if you sit there today and you dare to call yourself a Christian, it should be uh, something that uh, makes a difference in the easy times and in the difficult times. The book of 1 Peter is Peter's attempt to write to those who are out in the Roman provinces as a warning and as a preparation for difficult times to come. And part of his message, and the message we're going to look at this morning, is that Jesus Christ's salvation in our lives is sustained no matter how difficult life might get around us. We are secure in Christ because of what He has given to us. We can say thank you to God that the world can come in and bring us difficulties, problems, trials, temptations, but it can never reach into our lives and steal away Jesus Christ because His position and place in our life is totally secure because of the work that God has done, the finished work of Christ and the loving work of God. So Peter assures them that as these difficult times begin to approach them, and to encroach upon their lives, their lifestyles, their comfort zones, that uh, Jesus Christ is totally secure as a relationship in their life. Three things I want to share with you this morning about our salvation. The, the first thing is that our salvation was provided for us. It is not something that any of us has earned. And because of that, we can, we can turn to God and say, thank you. When you say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was their way of saying, God, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done by giving Jesus Christ to me. We should have the right attitude toward God. Having a thankful heart. Not coming into uh, the Christian life and saying, okay, now I've got to do this and do this and do this. And all these expectations are upon me. But lovingly serve God as a way of saying, thank you, God, for giving me forgiveness for by your mercy loving me and giving me eternity in your presence. Why in the world would you do that, God? Why would somebody care enough to do that? God didn't just pick out the people on this, this earth that were worth loving. God, And there aren't any of those, no matter how many we think there are. There aren't any of those from God's vantage point. But God looked across the whole scope of the earth, taking the worst to the best, seeing all as lacking and loving each and every one and would have died for each one. We might sit here today and say, you know, I could get enough emotion and commitment in my life to, uh, to die for this person, to die for that person, to die for, die for that person, to die for that person in my family. But would you die for the person that you dislike the most? Would you take that penalty upon yourself that they might have coming to them? We're watching all these trials uh, or the reports of these trials of heinous crimes that folks have done, the arrests that, that have come in Kansas City alone, much less across the nation. And the horrible uh, uh, descriptions of what, have been, what has been going on. And it brings up an emotion saying, I hope that person gets it. I hope they get the worst that they can get. But the love of God would have died for that person. Jesus Christ would have hung on the cross for that person with all the wrong and the horrors that they committed in their life. His love for them would have, have put that on the cross with Him, died for them, and brought them forgiveness. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, got, it's uh, 
Peter's way of saying we need to say thank you to God for everything that he has done. So we need to have the right attitude toward God because of what he has done for us. There was a Baptist pastor in uh, George Washington's day who knew George Washington, and his name was Peter Miller. And in fact, he was a close friend. He walked 70 miles to meet with George Washington. And he walked that 70 miles to ask George Washington to... Uh, to uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, to uh, pardon a man named Michael Whitman. And George Washington said, well, I really can't do that because if he's got uh, justice coming to him, then uh, I really shouldn't step in and do that. And I cannot pardon your friend. And uh, Peter Miller said, no, he's not my friend. He is the bitterest enemy that I have. And George Washington said, well, that makes it totally different. If you'll walk 70 miles for your bitterest enemy, then I can at least pardon him because you've requested that. That is beginning to touch on the kind of love and mercy that God has shown toward us sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died, gave His life, shed His blood for each and every one of us. So we can say thank you because God has done that according to His great mercy. We need to have the right attitude toward that. And we need to accept it also on the right basis. We don't find God's salvation by going out and earning it. It is not something that we can earn. God's great mercy provided it for us. And we receive it on that account and that account alone. It's not a mixture of all do some things and accept this from God also. No, we have to come before God saying, God, I bring nothing in my hands. I receive completely because of what you've done for me, your, uh, your salvation for my life. You cannot earn it at all. It looks like you might be earning it because you, you may uh, be in church serving, you may be in church teaching, uh, providing some kind of work for the gospel of Christ. And people may look at your lives and say, see all the things they're doing. They're, uh, they're earning God's good favor and God will let that kind of person into heaven. But we need to be humble before God and recognize that no matter how many good things a relationship with Christ may lead us to do, it never earns one small portion of our right into heaven. When we were in San Francisco, we stopped at a place called Sausalito. We just got out of the airport and stopped in Sausalito on the way up, uh, up north. And we went down by the, the side of the bay where they've got an, an over, overlook out. You know, we can see San Francisco, the city in the distance. And while we were sitting there, I noticed that this guy, uh, that there were birds everywhere and he could throw things to the birds. But after a while, I noticed that a guy had a bird actually stepped on his hand. On, on his arm was eating out of his hand. And I thought that was the most amazing thing that I'd ever seen, that a bird would get that close to that guy and eat out of his hand. A, uh, about a week later, we went to a museum in San Francisco, and the birds were there again. And uh, Katie and uh, Matthew and, uh, and Timmy and I were out there while the rest of them were still in the museum. And uh, birds came from everywhere. And I had this jar of peanuts that I had brought for us, and these birds loved peanuts. And we had uh, drawn them so close into us that they were crawling on us. They were uh, on our arms. I would just stick out my handful of peanuts, and three birds would jump on my, my fingers and just perch there and start eating out of, the, out of my hand. And people, Japanese tourists were walking by, and I'd just kind of wait for them to get right there, and then I'd stick my hand out with the peanuts, and then birds would hit from every direction. They'd go, whoa! They thought that was the neatest thing. Like I was something special. It was nothing to do with me. It had to do completely with the peanuts. And as long as we had those peanuts, uh, we had those birds' attention until Timmy decided this is too big a temptation. He grabbed one by the tail and started trying to, to hang on to it, and feathers flying, flying everywhere. They kind of backed off after that. But up until that time, we didn't earn that. It was totally what we brought with us. You know, we had in our possession something that drew every one of those, uh, those creatures to us. And we don't earn salvation. It may look like we're, uh, we're doing it but to others' eyes, but it is simply the work of God in our lives. And we need to accept it on that basis and that basis alone. The only thing that we earn is judgment. The wages of sin is death. We never earn mercy. We never earn grace. That is God's choice. Because of what Christ did, it opens the avenue for God to place that grace in our lives. And so we do not earn it. We must accept it on, on God's terms humbly coming before God and receiving it through Christ. And a third thing is that we have an assurance because 
of one thing that the Bible points to, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a hope. We don't have a hope that can wane away. At the first of this, uh, this baseball season, I thought the Royals were really going to go. I had a hope that was active, and I thought they were going to win some games and really get up there in the standings. And here we are at the end of July, and they've got the longest losing streak in all of their uh, history, and they're at the bottom of the pack. And, and uh, you know, that's a hope that just died. And uh, now I just can't wait. When are the Chiefs going to start playing now? Because the Royal season is, is pretty much over. Maybe we can go there. Uh, Wednesday night, and, and you know, I've never gone, and they've lost. I've never gone to a Royals game, and they have lost. They had lost 15 straight, and I was riding home on the plane, and I told the guy that when they were uh, going to be playing tonight, they're going to win tonight because I'm back in town. They lost every game when I was out of town, but now I'm back, and they're going to win. They won that game. They haven't won much since then, but they won that game anyway that I got back. So we'll see if they can win Wednesday night. Come out Wednesday night and see if... Uh, if they can continue that winning streak with the, the preacher in the, in the stand. It seems to make a difference. But we have a living hope. What is the proof of that hope? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can never snatch that away from, from, uh, from history. It is there. It is settled. Uh, all these other so-called messiahs and so-called holy guys from the past that religions follow after, they're all dead, buried, and secured in their little tombs. Jesus Christ has an empty tomb. And that is the living hope that we have in our salvation. It's because of the resurrection from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, was here for 40 days, just long enough to substantiate His resurrection as a fact, and then He went to do His work at the right hand of God. He is resurrected, and that gives us a hope in our salvation that we one day will also be resurrected. It's a salvation produced, provided for us. Second thing is, it's a perfect salvation. Uh, it says, in verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is in, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Five descriptions of our salvation. First description is, it is an inheritance. An inheritance is not something you earn. An inheritance is something that somebody else earns and you get the benefit of at a point in time. Our salvation is an inheritance provided for us. You've got, and it won't, it won't disappear at all. It's an inheritance that will be intact, complete. You see these bumper stickers on these motorhomes saying, we're spending our children's inheritance. Now, God's not up there spending away all our inheritance at all. It'll be just as secure 50 years from now, 500 years from now, as it was 1,000 years ago, as it was the day that Jesus Christ shed His blood on Calvary. Our inheritance is secure. It's an inheritance that we have. Uh, a man works all of his life. A man or a woman works all their life and, and gets taxed on all this income. And then they die. And the government steps in and says, well, we want 58 more. At least that's what it was a couple of years ago. 58 more percent of your income through an inheritance tax. There's not going to be any of that taxing or taking away. Our inheritance is secure in Jesus Christ. It's also imperishable. That means that our and all the benefits of it will never wear out, will never rust out. You know, I, I remember uh, in 1984, back when you, before kids, when you could actually buy a new car. <laughs> you can't do that after you have kids. You can't afford it. But back then, where you could get one that, that, that wasn't pre-owned, as they call it now, and, uh, that car was just, just shiny and new, and Lynn and I had that in 1984. Uh, that car today... You know, the car I had in high school, I thought it was the fanciest thing around. It wasn't new, but it was a fancy-looking car. You know, it had the big side pipes and everything on it. That car today is probably in a junk heap somewhere because uh, the mileage on it is probably 200,000, 300,000 on it by now, and it, it's worthless now. The way things in this world go, they rust out, they wear down, and no matter how long you live, no matter how long you wait to enjoy your sacrifice, in its completeness, in our inheritance in heaven. It will not perish. It is imperishable. Uh, the Bible, Jesus talked about it in Scripture about uh, the moss cannot make it uh, deteriorate and the rust cannot destroy it. Thieves cannot break in and steal it. It is all secure and waiting for us. It is imperishable. It will not break down like a house. It will not rust out like a car. 
but it's, uh, it's ours. It's a living hope that we have that it will be secure and complete when we arrive in the presence of God. It's also undefiled. That means that it will not stain, or it cannot be stained or polluted. It will not cheapen, grow old uh, with age. It cannot be touched by anything that would be destructive to it. It's also unfadeable. Uh, when you look at our salvation, it won't fade away. It won't lose its freshness. It uh, won't lose its value, its beauty. I'm glad that in the 1970s that uh, I didn't, or I guess my dad at that time, didn't spend all of his money buying stock in uh, beta instead, you know, uh, or uh, LPs or 8-track tapes or all these things that totally lost their value by, uh, by our time. Uh, even electric typewriters, you don't see those anymore. You know, that was a, a big thing back then. But they've totally lost their value. They've gone out of style, out of effectiveness. But the salvation we have will never fade away. It will never lose its, uh, its, uh, its value. Nothing can take it away at all. It will always be secure in Christ. And it is reserved for you. It has your name on it. In San Francisco, there's a place called Daly City that years ago we would go there and uh, do a church service at an elementary school in a big Filipino area. And Daly City is built. Every house, as you look over these hillsides, every house looks the same, except it's just a different color from the next one, or it's a reverse floor plan. It's all the same, like a little cookie-cutter house maker put all those houses up there. Heaven's not going to be like that. It's going to be reserved for each one of us. There's going to be a distinction for each one of us. Distinction upon rewards, distinction upon uh, differences and personality as God created us that way. It will be the perfect match for each one of us that we will finally get to enjoy in our created time that God has placed us here. There will finally be a perfect, a perfection, a completeness that we come in contact to. It's reserved for each one of us with our name upon it. It is safely kept for each one of us. It won't fade away. It won't be defiled. It won't be stolen away. It's reserved for us, and it's our inheritance, not because of who we are, but because who Jesus Christ is and because we became joint heirs with Jesus. And because of that, we receive this wonderful inheritance as part of our salvation. Let me share the third thing real quick about uh, this salvation. It's also protected. It's a protected salvation. Verse 5 says, Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All this persecution was going to come to the provinces of uh, the Roman provinces that uh, Peter described here. The fortresses that were surrounded were, would be uh, surround the lives of these people would be spiritual fortresses, fortresses, and the person guarding these lives, guarding everything about these people, would be the power of God. The power of God would make them secure. Uh, they would be complete. You look in Romans 8 and it says, Who can separate us from the love of God? Can death, can life, can, can, can all these height and depth and all these different descriptions there of things that cannot separate us from God. We are secure in our salvation. We look in the Old Testament and we find out that uh, a lion's den, a den full of hungry lions. And we were at Marine Land. I saw one lion. We were on the second row and I about backed up to the back row. That guy scared me. And then they brought out a whole cage full of tigers. I can't imagine Daniel sitting in there with the hungry lions who are trained to devour and yet God keeping him secure and safe. Nothing can separate us. When God is protecting us, nothing can threaten us upon this earth. Three guys end up in a fiery furnace. If anything is going to get you, a fiery furnace is going to get you. You know, fire just burns and we're combustible and you just get in fire and that's it for you. But these guys protected by the power of God were secure even in a fiery furnace. God's power can protect you from a giant when all you got is a slingshot. It can protect you when your brothers sell you into slavery and send you into a foreign country. God can take you in that situation and make you second in power in the land. God's power to protect us and provide for us is, is not determined upon the level of difficulties we may be dealing with at the time. God doesn't care about that stuff. He can whip any of it. He just cares about our lives and our devotion to Him. And He works through our, our exercise of faith directed toward Him. Protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. 
not through works, but through faith. God is looking for those open windows in our lives. And through those open windows of faith, trust, belief in Him, He's able to bring into our lives this undergirding, this securing, this protecting. Protecting us in the financial area, protecting us in our home area, in our marriages. When we open those windows through faith in God, allowing His protection to filter into our lives, it makes all the difference in the world. Flying in that airplane over there, over to California, you ever think about how uh, heavy an airplane is? I don't think there's anything heavier than an airplane. I don't think a blue whale is heavier than an airplane. And yet, uh, this thing gets off the ground. That really doesn't make sense to me. I know some people have figured it out. You know, start way back with the Wright brothers. They figured something like that out. But it makes no sense. My mind tells me that, well, we're going to get this thing on a runway. We better all get out and push. You know, don't get in. Get out and let's all start pushing it. And if we're going to get it up in the air at all, we all need to kind of, uh, you know, get under it and, and, and push. Or at least when we're starting to take off, we need to just grab our seats and kind of pull up on uh, our seat cushions or whatever. If we're going to have any chance of getting this thing off the air, yeah, off the ground. And yet, because of the law of aerodynamics, and if you can get the some speed going, and if the jet engines, after you've got it in the air, can maintain that speed, so the aerodynamics just keep going, there's so much of a force at work there that it keeps something that heavy in the air. Now, if I don't have faith, I'm going to be lifting, I'm going to be sweating, and I'm going to be worrying about what's going to happen here because we're actually trying to get this heavy thing off the ground. But if i got faith, I'm going to find a cushion and accept a, a blanket from the from the flight attendant, and I'm just going to find a comfortable spot and relax as much as the kids will let me relax. Relax over there and try to get some sleep because I have total faith in, uh, in this thing is going to stay up in the air all the way for uh, a thousand miles. The faith that we have in God is a faith that uh, we can be secure in God's protection in our life, that God has this whole thing under control. There is a greater law of grace working than the law of problems and difficulties and trials and temptations in this world. And as long as we keep our focus on the right law, working on our behalf, the law of grace and mercy, then it will sustain us. It will keep us flying high for Christ. His protection will come in and our salvation will be secured all the way to the end. We're not going down in Nevada. We're not going down in Kansas. You know, heaven forbid we go down in the middle of that Kansas area there. You know, God is going to sustain us. You know, flying over uh, the Rocky Mountains, you, know, you can see the snow sticking up there. Maddie was, was worried to death that some bad guy was going to break the snow so that the red stuff would come out. You know, he just knew lava comes out, all these volcano movies, and he was just, that bad guy's not coming to break that snow, is he? And he was just so worried all the way there. Uh, no faith at all. God wasn't going to let us go down halfway there. God was going to bring us all the way through. God is going to bring us all the way through in this life and secure us to the end, to His designed end for our life and make us effective in serving others and reaching the lives of others. Let me, uh, let me close by sharing with you the, the story of Dr. Boris uh, Kornfeld. He was a, was a Russian Jew who ended up in a Siberian prison camp. He was also a, a doctor. So because he was a doctor, he was ordered to take care of the needs of prisoners and guards. One of the prisoners that he met was a, was a Christian man who uh, had a very quiet faith but had a frequent habit of, of repeating the uh, Lord's Prayer. You know, uh, different phrases of it he would repeat over and over to kind of comfort himself. And this uh, Russian Jew didn't like that. You know, he's an Old Testament guy if he's anything. He didn't like this New Testament Lord's Prayer at all. But he couldn't get it out of his mind. And one time he had a guard come in to be operated upon and he had to fix a, a, uh, an artery. And he was very tempted to just leave that artery bleeding enough where it would kill the guard. It looked like he fixed it, but he would leave it in, enough where it would eventually uh, cause uh, uh, an inner bleeding that would kill him. But while he was doing it, he was appalled at that hatred that he had inside. And it led him to go back to the words that that man had repeated over and over that said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And because of that, he changed his own heart toward Christ. And as he uh, began to change his, his heart and his life, he began to do things differently. He even turned in a, a guard who had, uh, had stolen food from the prisoners there. Uh, that seemed to get him in trouble with the guards. And one particular day, he, uh, 
he had a man come in who had intestinal cancer. And he began to work on this guy with intestinal cancer. This guy had hollow eyes and had no hope. And he took time to share with this man about the love of Christ and the hope that Christ brings, even in a Siberian prison. This man left, and that very night, this man was taken out after the operation. That very night, uh, Dr. Kornfeld was killed. Somebody came in and killed him, probably one of the, one of the guards who he had turned in or, or a friend of the guards. But that patient that he had witnessed to that last day of his life, that patient who had cancer and was healed by the, the hands of Dr. Kornfeld, that uh, man ended up coming out of prison, coming out of Russia, and sharing with the world the love of Christ and the hope uh, that he had in Christ. Just speaking at uh, American universities and everything, his name was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who lay one day on a table with no hope, with cancer. And yet God design for his life, hope for his life, brought a salvation to him through, uh, through the, the words of a man who was living his last 24 hours. And the salvation of, of Alexander Solzhenitsyn began that day. And that salvation won't fade away, won't disappear. The completeness of it, which Dr. Kornfeld's enjoying now, is reserved in heaven as an inheritance protected by God that none can steal it away. And we may think we walk a simple aisle and, and pray a simple prayer, but that prayer changes eternity. It gets God involved in our eternity in a way that nothing that's been created or ever been can steal a moment of it, a piece of it, away from us. Would you bow?